Hello, welcome to the Paradigm Shift, episode 74, Understanding God, Shaping Our Character. I'm Apostle Matthew Shoemaker. When we go through struggles in life, we often ask this question, Why God? <laughs> Have you ever asked that? The underlying implication behind that question is that God has done something wrong in the situation. We're asking God, God, why did this happen to me? <laughs> Give me an explanation. <laughs> the truth is that we don't want to look at ourselves. <laughs> We're looking for somebody else to take responsibility for what we've created most of the time. <laughs> This is human nature. Many times, we, the reason we go through difficult experiences in life is that our character needs to be shaped. God <laughs> had a better way, but we wouldn't listen to Him and we did it our way. <laughs> but God is still God even when you mess up. And so what He does is He uses that journey along the way to help you overcome your flesh nature and learn to submit to Him and to walk by His Spirit, which is much different. <laughs> I'll talk to you briefly about the potter and the clay. Have you ever been reeling in life? Things are going round and round. It's the same old thing. Things seem to be going nowhere, and you're going, God, what is going on? Well, he is the potter, you are the clay. So what potter and clay is, or the potter working on the clay, the clay gets set on a wheel that's much bigger than the clay. <laughs> Say God's wheel. And when he begins to shape your character, sometimes you feel like nothing's happening, Lord. Nothing's changing. And what he's actually doing, you're going through a process that you feel like you're going nowhere, but you are changing. <laughs> Just like a vessel is or a pot on the potter's wheel. And the purpose of that is he is shaping your character. That's what he's doing. So many things we go through in life, we're sitting here going, <laughs> God, this isn't your promise. This isn't your promise. And he's going, yeah, this is the precursor to my promise because when I fulfill a promise, it will be perfect. And so he is getting you prepared to hold that which he is going to, to, to deposit within you. He's shaping your character and he's making it beautiful. You see, many times we just want, <laughs> give me this now, Lord, give me this now. And no, it's not time yet. It's time for you to submit to his hands. <laughs> And so many times when he's shaping our character, there are obstacles to our progress in God that we don't see. We don't discern them. But they're real and they're there. So here's what Jacob went through. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over his, all his possessions. All his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. <laughs> the man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Genesis 32, 22, 
through 27 NIV. And so what is this story really about? Well, we see that at the beginning of the story, Jacob and his entire family and all of his possessions are getting over an obstacle to their progress. That's when God takes you on a journey in life that there's an obstacle to your progress, but <laughs> you got to get over. You got to get over it. So, <laughs> here is the obstacle to our progress. Jacob, his name means seizing by the heel. And most people say heel grabber. Okay. So, what is this? Well, <laughs> Now, you have to know God's Word to understand this. What Jacob actually did is he put somebody else down to self-exalt at his birth. See that? He pulled somebody else down to exalt himself. We have to get over that tendency. Because <laughs> that's the thing we have to get over, you see. <laughs> Jacob's name was changed. Say, he'll change our character. You see, God will give you a new name. And so what God is doing with Jacob right now, he is shaping his character because when you <laughs> see <laughs> he who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted so that's what Jacob actually did at birth he exalted himself he pulled somebody else down and self exalted we have to get over that tendency that sin see now how does God get you over this obstacle <laughs> Well, he breaks the strength of your flesh. Say, my flesh nature. When I'm trying to do everything in the strength of my flesh rather than submitting to the way that God wants to do it. <laughs> God's capable of exalting you, but he does it when you humble yourself. That's his word. And he honors his word above his name. So much of our culture in Christianity and in America is built around putting others down. From economy to everything else. In the church. So what God is doing is taking us through a process that breaks our tendency to put other people down. Because those who humble themselves will be exalted. What God is doing is changing our character so we'll do it like Jesus humbling yourself and then letting God exalt you. <laughs> so often we get in the, in the middle of those struggles in life and we misunderstand God. We misunderstand Him. We think, God, you're not doing right to me. This is your promise and your promise is not fulfilled. What's wrong with you? <laughs> And we may not say what's wrong with you, but that's what we're feeling as human beings. And when we do that, what we've done is get, gotten an accusatory attitude toward God, and we don't understand what He's trying to get us to do is to stop trying to do it in our own strength. Because when He decides to promote you, no one will stop you, but you must humble yourself to the way God wants it done according to his character. That is the lesson that every person must learn, me included. And so, this is when we misunderstand God. When we see God involved in a situation and we think he's done something unfair, unwarranted, uh, <laughs> and there's an example of this very early on in the Bible, and it's Cain and Abel. And this understanding of Cain and Abel's story that occurs in Genesis chapter 4. We need to remember I've done a lot of teaching about the Garden of Eden and what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, which is insecurity. It causes you to feel embarrassed 
and yields all the fruits of the flesh. Say the flesh nature is insecure. But the nature of the Spirit submits to God and just does what He says. And as you humble yourself to His ways, He exalts you. Not in self-exaltation, man doing it, but in God doing it. So, this is the story of Cain and Abel. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord I brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought forth some fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Now I'm going to stop for just a second. And I've talked about perspective a lot. Now when your face is downcast, you're looking down at yourself. So you are self-centered, selfish. You feel low because your perspective is that way. It's about when you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are insecure and it makes you see the things, the situations that you're in through the lens of fallen man. Say, my perspective has fallen. And that's what's happening to Cain here. He's not seeing things rightly. He, his perspective is distorted. So I'll continue reading. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today, you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord will put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. <laughs> so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Genesis 4, 1 through 16, NIV. Now, <clears throat> there's something specific there. There was a desire within Cain to hurt Abel say that sin crouching at his door the door of his heart he was going god was talking about letting something into his heart that's the door he's talking to cain about something entering his heart that should not and his instruction to cain was you must rule over it that is the character that god is shaping in us when we are rulers after the pattern of God, which is what mankind is supposed to be, the way we rule by the kingdom of God and its laws and statutes is when sinful nature, say the flesh nature, wants 
to rise up in us and do something ungodly, we must rule over it. And many times in life we go through those experiences <laughs> where God is teaching us, hey, you can't do it that way. you got to rule over that. <laughs> you must overcome it. Say, get over it. Get over your selfishness. That's the way Jesus ruled. He never had any in Him to start with. <laughs> We're different. We are fallen and so, <laughs> Jesus was the only one that was flawless. So we are fallen, and yet God has taken a perfect lamb and sacrificed it for us so that we can enter in to the nature of Christ. You see? And so, what's going on in this situation between Cain and Abel? Well, God says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? We always want to blame God for the situations that we create. And a lot of people, when they interpret this, they read the story of Cain and Abel, and they miss a key thing that is absolutely paramount to understanding what's happening here between Cain and Abel. Cain has got this tendency, he wants to say, God, that ain't fair. Look at all this work that I've put in. See, he's selfish in his perspective. Say, downcast. So, what is really going on with Cain? Cain's not seeing things the way they really are. And this is the same thing that people do when they read this story about Cain and Abel. Cain's got an offering. It seems good. Abel's got an offering. It seems good. But God just randomly rejects Cain's offering. Cain didn't know. Well, let, let's see about Cain knowing. God, at this point, this story occurs in Genesis cap, chapter 4. And so, <laughs> if we go back to the instructions that God gave man, now, He hasn't given man many instructions to this point. Very, very few. In fact, really, the only thing that he's told them, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, I'm putting it into a small package here without going back over old territory too much. All he's told mankind up to this point, the only rule that he's given them, is do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do that. And here's Cain. Now we miss this. This was only two chapters ago in Genesis chapter 2 when God gave man this instruction, mankind. And here is Cain thinking God's not treating him right and he's got a pile of fruit. Now, how quick are we to forget what God said? <laughs> This is the nature of man. We get caught up in our own self-interests and don't pay attention to what God told us. The only instruction up to this point in the story of Cain and Abel is don't mess with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's Cain giving a sacrifice to God and it's a big old pile of fruit. And it got rejected. And guess what? Guess what kind of fruit that is? You think God... Now, this is man's nature just to assume that God just decided randomly that this is a bad pile of fruit. No. He's already said, don't do that. So, what, I, what am I saying? I'm saying, all we have to do is look at God said to know why Cain's offering was rejected. God has given one instruction, and here Cain has got a pile of produce in front of him that God has rejected. All we have to do is put, just do a little math here. Rejected offering, God has given one instruction. Now, what's wrong with the offering? It violated the one and only instruction that God gave. So it's fruit of the wrong kind. That's what it is. That's why it's rejected. 
And we see this operating within Cain, this nature. We, we know Adam and Eve, their perspectives say they were, Adam was looking at Eve and looked down and he looked at himself and looked lower. Say, downcast perspective, here it is again. Say, fallen perspective of man, how man sees. And so here it is in Cain, his countenance is downcast. Well, how do we know where that comes from? We've seen it before with his parents. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's Cain with an offering to God, a giant mess. Have you ever created a giant mess and wanted to blame it on somebody else? That's what Cain did. And he wanted to say, look at all this work I put into this. Look how invested I am in this. When you get invested in sin, don't bear down and do it any, even more. Don't do that. It doesn't do any good. For if you do well, will you not be accepted? That's God's instruction. When you've laid a giant mess before him and he doesn't accept what you've done, is it God's fault or yours? Every person has done this, including myself. Every one. Now, here's what Satan does to try to uh, get you to not repent. Exactly what he did to Cain. It's your brother's fault. Go attack somebody else. So now here, <laughs> here you've made a giant mess and you can't overcome God, so now you're going to attack another person. Blame it on them. Take it out on somebody else. They're accepted. God's supporting what they're doing, and He's, he's not supporting what I'm doing, so now I'm going to get covetous and jealous, which is exactly what Cain did. It's just more fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil bearing witness in Cain's heart. So what I'm saying is this natural, this thing going on the outside of Cain involving fruit and produce is a representation of what's going on in his heart. What goes on in the heart of all mankind when we eat from the tree of insecurity, when we're embarrassed as God rejects what we've done and we start looking at all the consequences for this mess that we've made and we want to blame it on somebody else. And so then we commit character assassination. Cain goes and he puts Abel down. Kills him. Say, character assassination. Abel was in good character. God accepted what he had done. And yet he murdered him. So that's what happens when you commit character assassination against somebody else. It's you're acting like Cain. And so Cain was in a giant mess. He, nobody created the mess but Cain. And so here he's, he's killed somebody. <laughs> he's still given an offering to God. God's rejected it. And, of course, Cain is hugely invested in this big effort. He's put all this time and energy into this. You know, when you've, had to, when you've been farming, <laughs> ministers should know what I'm talking about. You put a lot of time and energy. All people should. When you've, when you've put a lot of effort into something that you've decided that you're going to do on your own, <laughs> it doesn't align with God's instructions. And then you do it, and God says, no, we're not going to do it that way. So, <laughs> what does God do? Well, He can help you clean that mess up, but He's not going to do it on your terms. He's going to do it on His. What mankind has to get over is this tendency to rebel. Say God is shaping man's character. <laughs> now we know that a downcast countenance 
say, a downcast countenance. A countenance is somebody's attitude, face. So when you've got a downcast countenance, you are self-centered, insecure because you're thinking about how everybody else sees you. You're jealous. When you look at somebody else and see what they've got, you think, oh, I want what they've got because what I've got sucks. No. What you've, what you've got is not bad. You're seeing it the wrong way. If you do well, you'll be accepted. You are not the problem. It's your behavior. <laughs> See, you're a creation of God, and then what you do with God's creation, that causes the problem. <laughs> when we're getting over this thing, we just need to accept who God made us to be and follow His instructions. And then all the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil goes away. Now, that even applies to when you've created a huge mess like Cain has. Huge. So what does God say in that situation? Well, if people find out what I did, I'm done for. Have you ever done that? That's what Cain's doing right here. If anybody ever finds out what I did, I've had it. That's exactly what Cain says. He's afraid somebody's going to kill him if they find him. <laughs> so if it's ever revealed, this thing that I've done, it's all over for me. Well, God already knows what you did. He knows what I've done. He knows what every single human being, every mistake you've ever made. And this is the character of God. What's he do when we're in a mess that's all our fault? And he's given us instructions to prevent the mess that we've created and we didn't listen. How good is God? He tells Cain, no, I'll put a mark on you and I'll protect you. And anybody that slays you, vengeance will come on them seven times because the mark of God is on you and they'll know not to mess with you, boy. <laughs> See how good God is. Now here's sometimes men, we read that story of Cain and Abel and we think God is not being good. <laughs> God is so wonderful. He's given one instruction that got violated uh, to the point that there is a heaping mess. <laughs> and God says, no, all you got to do is repent and I'm going to put a mark on your head. Everybody that sees you, they'll know not to mess with you. Now this is the mark on your head. Say, seal the way you think. Put the maker's mark on the head of this one. <laughs> See? My goodness. God is ready to clean up, help us clean up our mess. Any time that we get truly cooperative and stop blaming Him for the situation that we have created. That's how good God is. My goodness. He doesn't condone sin. He gets us past it. Say, get over that obstacle. <laughs> That's when He's shaping our character. See, do we have any more evidence of this dynamic between Cain and Abel? Well, what do we do in life? We shape something in our mind. This will work. Say, I'm making a plan, but it's not God's plan. It's something I imagined. Say, I'm making an image like an idol. Do you know what Cain's name means? To form or fashion. That's what Cain means. To form. So what, what did Cain do? He formed an idea of what would be good without paying attention to what God had already said. And then what does Abel's name mean? Breath. 
Now, what makes a word? Breath. You see, he paid attention to the Word of God. That's why he was accepted and Cain was rejected. And then after Cain got rejected, God made him a way out of the situation that he created. He's so wonderful. God. His character. The things we go through in life, man. Human beings can make such a mess. And on an individual level, and on a global level, our world right now is in a state that is, it's not beyond fixing, but it's beyond man's ability to fix it by himself. We've got to submit to God and listen. And so, <clears throat> if you go back to that story about Jacob and breaking the power of the flesh, if you re read the fruits of the flesh, it's all the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the heart of man. <laughs> and so what does God do? <laughs> he breaks... When, when Jacob's trying to get over this obstacle to his progress, he breaks Jacob's hip. Okay? He broke Jacob's hip. What is that? It talks about tendons. And some translations describe this situation as the sinew in the hip of Jacob. Now remember, all of this is centered around God taking man through a process that shapes his character. That's what he's doing to Jacob. I'm coming back into the Jacob story. He has broken... God, people would read that and we misunderstand God. We say, why are you breaking his hip? That's messed up. He's teaching all of mankind a lesson. If we read God's word with our eyes open, we'll see his character as it really is. We will see him face to face. And so, he broke Jacob's hip. The sinew, the tendon. Now the hip, it comes from the thigh, and normally that's the strongest part of a man. Say, Jacob was trying to overcome God in the strength of his flesh, and that wasn't going to work. <laughs> Have you ever tried to overcome God in the strength of your flesh? No, I want to do it this way, God. No, I want to do it this way. This is a better way. No, it's not. So what does he have to do? He's got to touch the strength of your flesh and break it. That's what God is doing. And so in Jacob's case, it's the tendon or the sinew that is broken. That's the tendency in you to rebel because of your flesh nature. It's the sin in you. The tendon See? It's got to, uh, to do with the way you see life. It's the tendency to rebel because you want to do it your way. It's the sin in you that wants to try to strive against God. And so, as the hip is broken... It comes out of alignment. See, when we try to do things in the flesh nature, we get out of alignment with God. And He has to deal with that before we can get over the obstacle to our progress. We have to submit to God. And in this struggle, <laughs> there's always this thing we have to say, God, I'm not letting you go. 
I'm not going to let you go, Lord. And He won't let you go. If you have enough faith to say, God, I'm not letting you go until you bless me, He will work on you till He breaks that flesh nature and then you'll live by the nature of His Spirit and you will be blessed. You'll be able to cross over. Say, like getting over it. <laughs> and this is what happens to Jacob. Then the man said, the man being <laughs> the Lord, <laughs> then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Say, overcoming my flesh nature. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. <laughs> but he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, Is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Genesis 32, 28-32 in IV. And we see Israel say he changed his name, say new identity. He was working on his character. And see, as Jacob saw God face to face, he saw God's character. Say, so seeing him face to face. He stopped looking at himself and got his eyes on God. And he said, yeah, now I see what you're really doing. <laughs> he was shaping Jacob's character to get him to submit to the way God wanted him to do things not in <laughs> that nature that he was born with the desire to self-exalt to put somebody else down so you can self-exalt because he used to be a heel grabber that was his old identity then he was changed into Israel which means struggling or to struggle with God have you ever had enough faith that you'll struggle with God until your flesh nature, you won't let God go until your flesh nature is broken. And then God goes, yeah, that's what I was after. Now you see me face to face and your character will be shaped by the way I see. Now, you won't accuse me of being a bad God anymore. Come on. Let's get over it. <laughs> You see, <laughs> so many times in the world, <clears throat> God is looking for us to see the way He sees. Say, when the bride looks at her husbandman and the veil is removed, you see His character, the features of the face, character, identity, the way it really is. That's man's problem. We don't see God for how good He is. He's always helping us clean up the mess that we made. It's not God's fault. We did it. And that's how good He is. That's how good He is. We should never accuse God because when we get to accusing God, what we've done is our perspective has been downcast. We are selfish we are not seeing things the way they really are. Our perspective is not aligned with Him. We're not seeing God face to face and we're not looking at His character. We're looking at a reflection of ourselves instead. So when we've created that mess, all we have to do is realize that, no, I need to stop doing things in the strength of my flesh. Say, no God, not this, not this. No, don't do it that way. He's breaking that nature and He loves you. And we have to get over that tendency to resist God. 
and all your sin and all your resistance to Him and the mess that it's made, He's willing to help you with it. He knew you were going to do it before you did it. (laughs) He sacrificed His own perfect Son to deal with that nature. And so let's stop striving against Him and submit to His way and say, Yeah, Lord, let's do it Your way. And then we'll cross over. So much in this world we're taught to hide who we really are. You know, people put makeup on. Make it look better. Make it look better. Well, what about the person that you are? You know what God is looking for? He's looking for us to be the person that He created us to be, submit to His ways, and then in rejecting the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't be embarrassed about who God created you to be. Don't pay any attention to what other people think because they're not God. Only what He says matters. See, we've got to get over this thing where we're worried, ashamed, embarrassed of what other people will think or say if we come out and we take off the mask and we just show who God created us to be. You're not trying to uh, make your character look different or better than it really is. It's already a creation of God. You don't have to put a bunch of stuff on top of it to make it look better. And see, this is... (laughs) I'm talking about the deep things that go on in the heart of man. We're always worried about what other people will see when they look at us. (laughs) We've got our attention on the wrong things when we do that. You see? If we just go to God and say, God, what what do you say? I say this. Okay, great. That's all God wants. That's what the husbandman Christ is looking for in his bride. To remove that distorted view. See him as he really is. And all he wants to do is look back at you and see his creation that doesn't have something that's trying to cover up the reality of who they are. He knows who you really are. In fact, the things that he takes us through in life, all these processes that we go through, and all the struggle, what he's doing, he's cleaning up that mask that we've put on because we're worried about what other people think and what we think about ourselves rather than what God says. That's what he's doing. He's taking up all of that foundation. You see, when you have a fleshly foundation, he's trying to clean that off because he wants to see who you really are and for you not to be ashamed of what he's created. That's what he's looking for. That's who he really is. Don't be ashamed of the person God created you to be. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about you. God loves you. Every mistake you've made, He'll help you clean it up. Say, clean up that stuff on my face. (laughs) And that's when you sing God face to face for who He really is and you align your perspective with His. You've got your attention in the right place. And then because you're looking at Him, your character will reflect what you're looking at. That's how He reshapes man and shapes our character. Let me pray for you. Father God, I ask that this Word yield 
a crop, <laughs> a hundredfold for your kingdom, Father. Let your word go out and accomplish the purpose for which you sent it, for you said that it would. I rebuke you, devil, for trying to embarrass God's people. I rebuke you. You're a liar. And I speak to the heart of every person. You don't have to be embarrassed of who you are. You don't have to be embarrassed of believing in God. You don't have to be embarrassed and think about what people think about you. What you've done, the situations that you've created yourself. Just look at your Redeemer. That's the face. Those are the eyes that you need to be looking into. See how He sees. <laughs> You are a creation of God that is worth sacrificing the most precious man that has ever lived. That's God's perspective toward you. And there may be some things that He wants to change, but He won't change the person that He created you to be. He'll get everything off of you that stops you from being the person He created you to be. That's the work of the King of Kings. I love you. I love everybody that's listening. And I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I encourage you to check out my new book, The Power Cycle of Creation, A Wheel-Driven Vehicle. This is a spiritual journey exploring the perspectives of God toward all of creation, Christian culture, mankind, and time itself. Go to SovereignRoar.com to learn more. On the website, you can also sign up to receive the Judah Watch Monthly by email. This is an apostolic commentary on Christian culture and newsletter format. This has been an episode of the Paradigm Shift Weekly. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a new episode of the Paradigm Shift, a weekly video series produced by Sovereign Roar. Sovereign Roar is the apostolic marketplace ministry of Matthew Shoemaker.